pleased to introduce Jeremy Daggett, uh, who teaches at Great Hearts Monte Vista Charter School in San Antonio, and he's going to address us on SCOTUS's proof of the first being. Thank you. Uh, a few introductory remarks. Um, I wouldn't know about Father Peter if it weren't for uh, my good friend Jared Goff, Dr. Goff. Um, we met when we were Protestants, um, and he began entering into the Catholic Church, and I did my best as a good uh, Baptist mm -hmm. to uh, keep him out of the, uh, the whore of Babylon. And uh, many, many hours, hours late into the, uh, early into the morning with also my dear friend Alex Plato, um, doing my level best, and uh, <laughs> he ended up dragging me in with him. Uh, and then he got interested in this SCOTUS fellow and told me about you, and it was uh, well, another amazing adventure because, of course, my confirmation saint was uh, Thomas Aquinas. So I was sort of a, a, a Thomist by default. <clears throat> so learning about this SCOTUS guy was, uh, stretched me quite a bit. So. Uh, I, I will read this paper in, in honor, honor of you and uh, for having brought uh, Saint Th uh, Blessed John and Scotus to me. It was common for medieval thinkers to bring forth many separate arguments or ways for the existence of God, from motion, from efficient causality, formal causality, finality, imminence, truth, and others, and conclude each way with a rather, un, rather unsatisfying for some, and this everyone calls God. Scotus does something a little different, pressing into service an argument from metaphysical, rather than physical, efficient causality, as he begins his single, and rather long, proof for the actual existence of an infinite being. In book one of his lectura, Scotus explains why he intends to take the metaphysical route. Quote, now, efficiency can be considered either as a metaphysical or as a physical property. The metaphysical property is more extensive than the physical, for to give existence to another is of broader scope than to give existence by way of movement or change. And even if all existence were given in the latter fashion, the notion of one is still not that of the other. It is not efficiency as a physical attribute, However, but efficiency as the metaphysician considers it, that provides a more effective way of proving God's existence. For there are more attributes in metaphysics than in physics, whereby the existence of God can be established. We should note now that Scotus has a problem with the argument for motion, the ergo of that particular argument. What is the thing to which we conclude? We can agree that the this everyone calls God is most assuredly the first and unmoved mover, but even more sure are we that what everyone calls God <coughs> is much more than a prime mover. That among movers, the first mover is the most perfect or most noble mover is granted. But this does not entail that the first mover is therefore the most noble being. Scotus, Scotus argues thus by way of example. We may find a donkey, and he actually uses the example of a donkey, we may find a donkey, which is the most noble, even maximally noble, donkey. But this only proves that among donkeys there exists one which is most noble. But one can hardly infer from this that, therefore, the most noble animal exists. It is plain to see that additional arguments are necessary to establish more than the existence of a prime mover if we are to have a full-throated defense of the proposition God exists in the sense that is as close to what Christians mean by God as is possible via rational demonstration. For we must admit that the first mover is a being, but by what means can one argue that the most perfect mover is also the most perfect being? Even more exactly, how is an infinite being? Again, as Scotus says of metaphysical efficiency versus physical efficiency, the notion of one is not that of the other. Let us briefly outline Scotus's argument. He begins his ordinatio proof by explaining that there are two angles we must take in arguing for the existence of an actually infinite being. First, we must approach from the view of the relative properties of God. Second, from the absolute properties of God. Relative properties are those which are predicable of God in relation to creation. Absolute properties are those which belong to God whether or not he chose to create. Under the first heading of relative properties, 
SCOTUS argues for a triple primacy of efficiency, finality, and preeminence. From there, he shows that one primacy implies the others. And finally, there can only be one nature that is the first efficient cause, ultimate end, and the most perfect nature. From there, the subtle doctor discusses the absolute properties of God. The first being is intellectual and volitional, and the intellect and the will are identical with the essence of the supreme nature. The first being is also infinite being. While discussing the infinity of God, Scotus resurrects Anselm's that than which argument and responds to Aquinas' criticism that Anselm makes an illicit leap from concept to reality. Finally, he gives a definite answer of yes to the question of whether there exists an actually existent, uh, actually infinite being. The very next question of the Ordinatio deals with the unicity of the nature of the, uh, thus proved to exist. However, the De Primo Principio concludes with this argument. We include it in our overview uh, without argument. The reason is this. We do not worship merely a nature, but a personal God. It is not appropriate to conclude to a nature and pronounce this we call God when God, uh, when God is not merely a general nature. But God has a name, I am, who spoke with Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses. I must add here that I am grateful to Father Peter for pointing out this little gem. In the first appendix to his book on the Triple Way of Bonaventure, he draws out the importance of Scotus beginning his argument in the De Primo with a prayer to the I Am who revealed his name. I dare not go into that as I myself am still trying to think about what Father has written. Maybe afterward he can help us and further inflame our holy thoughts and desires. But I think we all notice immediately that Scotus has set the bar high. He does not ask whether God exists, rather whether an actually infinite being exists. And this is different than asking whether an eternal being exists. The cosmos may well be eternal, considered as a whole, but eternal existence does not necessarily entail infinite being, for something may exist eternally and still have a derived and sustained existence. In any event, as Scotus might say, the notion of one is not that of the other. So let's loop around and dig a little deeper into some of the argument. It is a rather extensive and complex argument, and we do not have time to give this anything resembling a full treatment. I propose to highlight some of the arguments made, hoping what you hear will inspire you to either revisit Scotus's argument or to give it a go around for the first time. Beginning with God's relative properties, he argues for a triple primacy of efficiency, finality, and preeminence. Scotus himself spends the bulk of time establishing the primacy of the efficient of efficient causality. The first conclusion he argues for is this. Among beings which can produce an effect, one is simply first in the sense that it neither can be produced by an efficient cause, nor does it exercise its efficient causality in virtue of anything other than itself. The proof for the conclusion runs something like this. Something, one, something, call it A, can be produced. Two, it is produced either by itself, nothing, or another. Three, not by nothing, for nothing causes nothing. Mm -hmm. Four, not by itself, for an effect never causes itself. Five, therefore, by another, call it B. If we return to uh, uh, proposition two, for B is produced, either by itself, nothing, or another. This series of causes will either continue infinitely, or we finally reach something which has nothing prior to it. Seven, an infinite ascending series is impossible Eight, therefore, etc. Scotus anticipates two objections to his argument. First, that he begs the question is seven, an infinite ascending series is impossible. Second, that the argument cannot be a demonstration since it begins with contingent propositions. <clears throat> he responds in order. The force of the first objection is established by the fact that most philosophers admit the possibility of infinite regress in an ascending series, as in the case of generation. However, Scotus notes that when it comes to essentially ordered series, Scotus goes into some, uh, sorry, however, Scotus notes that philosophers admit the possibility of infinite regress in accidentally ordered series. They do not do so when it comes to essentially ordered series. Scotus goes into some detail concerning the differences between essentially ordered causes and accidentally ordered causes. Uh, this is going to be a little, uh, just try to stick with me here on the, in this part. Uh, quickly then, first, in essentially ordered causes, the second cause depends upon the first and its very act of causation. In accidentally ordered causes, the second cause can act dependently 
uh, independently of the first cause in the series. Second, in, a, in essentially ordered causes, the causality is of a higher order. In accidentally ordered causes, there is no necessary hier hierarchy of order. So Scotus explains that this follows from the first difference because in accidentally ordered causes, a cause does not essentially require another cause of the same nature in order for it to exercise its causal power. However, this dependence upon another cause is precisely what is required for an essentially ordered series of causes. It follows that a higher cause in the chain is of a different nature and more perfect than the lower cause, which it is dependent upon the higher cause. Or we must admit the absurd conclusion that a cause is essentially dependent on, upon something less perfect for its own causation. Lastly, while in essentially ordered causes, all causes are simultaneously required, the causes may be successive in the uh, accidentally ordered series. So it is evident that accidentally ordered series of causes is a diachronic causation, while essentially ordered causes are synchronic. And this is very important for the defense of seven in infinite series, ascending series is impossible. These three important differences lead to three propositions. First, an infinity of essentially ordered causes is impossible. Second, an infinity of accidentally ordered causes is also impossible unless we admit that the essentially ordered series is finite. Finally, third, even if the existence of the essentially ordered series of causes is denied, an infinite series of causes is still impossible. The arguments in support of these propositions are worth looking into, and I urge you to do that, but time does not allow. Let us move briefly to the objection concerning the fact that the argument begins with the contingent proposition. That is, something can be produced. <clears throat> but effects are not necessary. Rather, they exist contingently. Therefore, the argument is not a demonstration. Scotus responds that the premises may not be necessary, but they are manifest. No one denies that there is, in fact, something really existing which has been produced or is an effect. Since nothing is the cause of itself, there must be an efficient cause which produced the effect. But Scotus, in order to respond more forcefully to the objection, proposes that the, pre uh, the, that the premises can be reformulated so that they are, in fact, necessary and thus defang the complaint. It is possible, possible here being as, as being defined as contrary to necessary, it is possible for something to exist which can be changed. He explains in the Lectura proof. Although beings different from God are actually contingent with respect to their final, uh, I'm sorry, to their factual existence, nevertheless, they are not with respect to their possible existence. Hence, those entities which are called contingent with respect to their factual existence are necessary with respect to their possible existence. For instance, although there exists a man is contingent, nevertheless, it is possible that he exists is necessary because his existence does not include any contradiction. Therefore, something different from God is possible is necessary. Because being is divided into the contingent and the necessary, just as necessity belongs to <clears throat> a necessary being in virtue of its condition or its quiddity, so possibility belongs to a possible being in virtue of its quiddity. If the first argument is alternatively qualified with the notion of ontological possibility, then we have necessary propositions as follows. First, it is possible that there is something different from God. It is not of itself because then it would not be the case that it were possible, nor from nothing. Therefore, it is possible that it is from something else. Either it is possible that the other agent acts by virtue of itself and not by virtue of something else, not being from something else, or it is not possible. If so, then it is possible that there is a first agent, and if it is possible that it exists, then it exists. If not, and there is no infinite regress, then the argument at once comes to a standstill. But in the De Primo Principio argument, Scotus argues this way from the very beginning. <clears throat> His first conclusion is that some nature among beings can produce an effect. He says, in this conclusion, as in some of those which follow, I could argue in terms of the actual thus. Some nature is producing since some nature is produced, because some nature begins to exist, for some nature is contingent and the result of motion. 
but I, but I prefer to propose conclusions <clears throat> and premises about the possible. For once those about the actual are granted, those about the possible are also conceded, but the reverse is not the case. Also, those about the actual are contingent, though evident enough, whereas those about the possible are necessary. The former concern the being as existing, whereas the latter pertain properly to a being considered even in terms of its essentials. The existence of this essence, of which efficiency is now established, will be proved later. Back to the ordinatio version, Scotus assures us that this, our third conclusion below, will establish the actual existence of this first efficient cause. On to the second conclusion. <coughs> this, possibly, this possible simple, I'm sorry, this possible simply first efficient cause itself cannot be caused. This flows from the first conclusion, which shows that the first uh, possible first efficient cause is by nature uncaused, since there would be either infinite regressive causes or a circle of causes. It is also clear that this being acts such that it is causally independent of any other being, else it could not be considered first. That it lacks an efficient cause means that it also has no final, formal, or material causes. As Scotus says, if something has no extrinsic cause, neither does it have an intrinsic cause. For while to be an extrinsic, final or efficient cause, does not imply imperfection but perfection, to be an intrinsic cause, material or formal cause, necessarily includes some imperfection, since the intrinsic cause is part of the thing it causes." End quote. Finally, the third conclusion, the efficient cause, the first efficient cause actually exists and some nature actually existing is capable of such causality. The nature of the first efficient cause is to exist of itself, since it cannot be caused to exist by anything else. It, would, it, will, it was proved earlier that it is possible that this first being exists and must be absolutely first. Here, Scotus makes a fascinating move. He says that the quote, Proofs of proposition A, an infinity of essentially ordered causes is impossible. This proof can also be used to establish the existence of this being as proposed by this third conclusion. But in this case, they are based on contingent though manifest propositions. If the proposition that an infinity of essentially ordered causes is impossible, if this proposition is understood of the nature and the quiddity and the possibility, then the conclusions proceed from necessary premises. From all this, it follows that an efficient cause which is first in the unqualified sense of the term can exist of itself. Consequently, it does exist of itself. For what does not actually exist of itself is incapable of existing of itself. Otherwise, a non-existent being would cause something to exist. But this is impossible, even apart from the fact that in such a case, the thing would be its own cause and hence could not be entirely uncaused. Here he recalls the second objection that the argument begins with contingent propositions and is therefore not a true demonstration. He refutes the objection by starting yes with, contingent, uh, with a contingent proposition, but drawing, drawing from this manifest proposition and necessary proposition that it is possible that something exists. From there, we can move through all the steps of the argument and arrive at an actually existing first efficient cause. Scotus concludes. Quote, therefore, if it can exist owing to the fact that to be is not contradictory to it, then it follows that it can exist of itself and consequently that it does exist of itself. What Scotus is saying here is that if it is possible for an uncausable nature to exist, then it must exist. For if it is possible for it to exist and it does not exist now, then it can never exist. Nay, more, it is impossible for it to exist if it does not exist now. But the possibility of such, such existence has already been shown. Therefore, a simply first efficient cause exists. We must sadly pass over the other premises. Uh, we note that the arguments for finality and preeminence are similar to that of efficiency, as Scotus himself notes. It says, uh, before moving to the absolute properties of God, observe that Scotus argues that one primacy implies the others, the first efficient cause acts primarily for the sake of itself, else it could not possess the primacy of finality. Of eminence, the first efficient cause is an equivocal and not univocal cause. <clears throat> Therefore, it is the most noble nature, given what has been said thus far. 
Finally, Scotus argues that there can be only one nature possessing this triple primacy. Please see his arguments for the compelling reasons. On to the absolute properties of God. He first shows that the first nature is voluntary and intellectual. He offers three arguments. Nature acts on account of an end, and it does this only because it is dependent upon and directed by someone who knows the end. The second is that this first agent acts for the sake of an end. Now, I would like to pause on the third argument for just a moment and give it to you in a little more detail. Duns says, something causes contingently, therefore the first efficient cause causes contingently. And this means it causes voluntarily, that is to say freely. If this were not the case and God caused necessarily, then there would be no contingency anywhere. Our own willing would be, nice, uh, would be necessary and not free, for every secondary cause causes insofar it is moved as it is Every secondary cause causes insofar as it is moved by the first cause. So a first cause causing necessarily requires that every cause or movement down the line of the uh, essentially the ordered series will be caused necessarily. If God necessarily moves my will, causes my willing, either as the immediate cause or through an interme intermediary cause, which itself is, is itself necessarily caused, or moved, and thus acts of necessity to move my will, the consequence is my willing is necessary. Alternatively, anything causing contingently means that the first cause exercises its causal powers freely and not of any necessity. This doctrine is important as it relates to God's causation at extra. God creates the heavens and the earth freely and not from any strict demand of his nature, so to speak. As my time is rapidly coming to an end, and yes, we shall have to skip over the remaining conclusions of the proof and, uh, and move right on to the uh, absolute properties of God. Let us suffice to hear the conclusions just as they are presented by Scotus without arguing for them. Remembering that the first conclusion is that the first being is intellectual and volitional, and the second is, the second is the knowledge and volition of the first being is the same as its essence. <clears throat> The third, no knowledge can be an accident of the first nature. And finally, the intellect of the first nature knows everything else that can be known with the knowledge that is eternal, is distinct, is actual, is necessary, and is prior by nature to the existence of these things in themselves. Part two of the absolute properties of God deals with the proof of the infinity of the first being. Scotus offers four ways of proving thus. Taking from, them, uh, taking from the attributes found in the triple primacy of God. Uh, he proposes two ways from efficient causality, one from finality, and one from eminence. Uh, he lastly takes what he calls an ineffective proof, taking special aim at uh, Aquinas. Um, but I would like to move directly to the fourth proof from eminence. Here he argues that it is, in, it is incompatible with the idea of a most perfect being that anything should excel it in perfection. He has already shown in a section, sadly, we had to skip over, that infinity and being are not incompatible. And furthermore, it is not repugnant to the nature of the first being to be infinite. It follows it must be infinite. For if it were, inf I'm sorry, for if it were finite, it could be excelled, which is impossible. But I think that the most interesting part of this proof involves his coloratio Anselmi, the coloring or nuancing of Anselm's that than which. The ontological argument of Anselm has not a few detractors. Many dismiss it as a sort of philosophical pipe dream, obviously flawed, and it is parodied and mocked. But as Bertram uh, Russell wisely remarked, at least he is reported to have wisely remarked, quote, it is, it is much easier to be persuaded that ontological arguments are no good than it is to say exactly what is wrong with them. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> says that Anselm, in arguing that the existence of God is self-evident, uh, moved illicitly from an idea existing in the mind to exerting its actual existence in reality. In so doing, he voices a common, uh, even to this day, criticism, and I once myself made it. However, in the lecture, Scotus argues that this objection really misses the point. When it is argued with respect to Anselm's argument that, uh, this, I'm quoting from Scotus, when it is argued with respect to Anselm's argument that it is self-evident that the that that than which greater cannot be thought exists, I say as to this objection that it, it misses the case. It is not the case. 
It is not that Anselm's intention is to show that God exists as self-evident, but rather that it is true. He constructs two deductive arguments. The first of them runs as follows. If there is anything that does not exist, then something is greater. However, nothing is greater than that which is the highest. Therefore, what is the highest is not a non-being. The second deductive argument runs as follows. What is not a non-being exists. However, what is the highest is not a non-being. Therefore, what is the highest exists. That being said, Scotus does intend to do some nuancing of the argument. He says that we need to insert the phrase without contradiction into the description of God so that what is only implicit in the argument becomes explicit. For what is conceivable is that which is without contradiction. Anything which includes a contradiction is necessarily inconceivable, even if we can speak of something like a square circle. Because there is no contradiction between God and exists, we can safely conclude that the being which is the greatest conceivable without contradiction could possibly exist. But this being cannot only exist in virtue of the mind of the one conceiving it, for then it would be caused, in which case there would be a contradiction since the first cause is uncaused. Here is where the nuance to Anselm becomes more interesting. Scotus inserts it not as an argument all on its own, but as a final touch, as it were, to the whole argument for the existence of an infinite nature, since it presupposes uh, what has been set up to this point in Scotus's argument. Uh, finally, after this col uh, coloratio Anselmi, Scotus looks at what he calls an ineffective proof, but not wanting to offend any Thomas that might be present, I will skip over this particularly devastating critique of St. Thomas's <laughs> argument for God's infinity. <laughs> I noted at the beginning that Scotus concludes the De Primo Principio with an argument for the unicity of God, while the Ordinatio devotes a whole separate question to the matter. Personally, as a self-contained single argument for the existence of God, I prefer the De Primo rendering, if only for the sake of closure, to a rather long-running argument. Thank you. Before Father Peter comments, I'll just say uh, that one beautiful thing about the frustration you feel when you give such an excellent paper is that when we publish it, it'll be published in its entirety. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Father Peter. That's a good presentation of what Scotus actually holds. Pinpoints all of the uh, places where the objections are, are directed. Uh, there were great, great number of objectors, uh, objectors in contemporaries, in contemporaries as there are, are today, but there are also a great many people who are much moved by the arguments of Scotus, as they are moved by the arguments of St. Saint, Saint Anselm. They don't subscribe to the critique of St. Thomas and so many, so many others who lean on proofs which are physical in one way or another. Mm -hmm. This is the very point Cardinal Newman ma makes in his criticisms of Paley. Physical theolo uh, theology, confusing theology and metaph metaphysics with the physical order. Therefore, basing all of the distinctions to be made on on the, uh, the, uh, the act uh, act potenti potentiality, which is a uh, concept a to, to, uh, concept conceived by Aristotle in the physical or order. But we've gone beyond the physical to the metaphysical order, which is not simply a product of our, th of, uh, of our thinking, as Kant would, would, would make it. You might say Kant is the ultimate Thomist on this point. <laughs> uh, right. Yes, that's true. Everything that St. Thomas says is wrong with Anselm Clark. If Anselm Clark is wrong, there isn't any proof, because there is no physical proof for the existence of, of, of God. Mm -hmm. This is the interesting point. Now, to understand the second, well, I'm talking now about the, the uh, in the metaphysical order, you don't talk about an effect and a cause, but an, uh, but an effectible by nature, an effectivum, effectivum, that's the terminology of Scotus, but not everybody catches the, the significance of that change of ter terminology to distinguish between an accidental order of cause and effect and one which is e essential, in which the one, the absolute is one period. There is not a second who is absolute, absolute or anything of that, of that kind. I just made, now the second point I want to make here that is very very important. You can't understand Scotus's argument, which is beautiful, and all of the things that were implied, but not as we worked into uh, into it for, 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 for unless you understand the coloratio. 
he himself gives, gives a hint, and it refers explicitly, at least, to, to Anselm, um, and that is uh, very important. But uh, in the meantime, between Anselm and Scotus, those, uh, Scotus, we have the figure of St. Bonaventure. All you have to do is to read the first uh, article of the first question of the disputed uh, questions on the Blessed Trinity, where you see exactly the way in which, which Scotus adds uh, as a coloratio to Anselm. He doesn't say he's correctly Anselm, but he's using Anselm there. But it's an important point. Anselm and subsequently Scotus, uh, Scotus uh, don't, uh, don't dispense with the so-called physical uh, proofs, or cosmic proofs would be the be better ones, and the anthropological uh, proofs. If you read that, you see that Bonaventure analyzes the three categories very, very nicely. It can be modified in one way or another. The modification and the reordering of the different types of, of, of proofs for God's existence, or different aspects of God's existence, you might, 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 might see, depending on person, what is more, more, more appealing, more helpful in the Paso order gives you a background that I presume uh, Scotus must have been acquainted with what Bonaventure uh, says, uh, says here, because the most important argument for Bonaventure, what Kant calls the ontological argument, the misnomer if ever there was one, uh, was one, uh, was one, is precisely the principal argument, just as Scotus said, his argument de, de principio um, uh, principio is the essential argument. So when all those things are brought together, uh, I think uh, the, the genius of Scotus becomes quite uh, 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 quite apparent. But as there's so many other things, things if you're not familiar with the with the metaphysics and the dogmatic theology of Saint Bonaventure, you will have a hard time figuring out where Scotus is coming from, uh, uh, coming from coming from. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I admit I'm deficient uh, the, there. Uh, historically, uh, historically, uh, the, that is the is the term. No one has come up with a with a better, a better formulation of the argument for God's ex existence than the one that Scotus provides in this uh, particular essay, apart from the ordinatio. Uh, obviously, the ordinatio has to be studied also in relationship to this. But, but your presentation is very, very good. I think it's it's, uh, it's based on the actual t uh, text. You pinpoint the uh, the uh, the uh, problems that Scotus himself be, be in front, give the uh, give the answer and uh, let the, the benevolent lector, uh, reader uh, lector ben benevolus uh, 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 judge for himself whether or not it's uh, satisfying because that's all at this point that Scotus is Scotus intends if we go on as it were to to the uh, to the faith that's another point that, uh, very important to understand Scotus is he also in and in, in, in bon 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 show the relationship between the three types of, uh, of ar arguments and how it works in, as it were, to the study of the, uh, of, uh, of the Trinity. That's Article 2 of uh, Russia 1. Uh, is, uh, is there, no, he's simply, he's simply doing what, uh, what faith postulates. Faith seeks under, under, uh, understanding. understanding. And therefore, as it were, in a sense, as it were, there, you find in these proofs a certain basis, foundation, for believing in believing in the Trinity, or what Bonaventure says, before the fall, there was a kind of a natural knowledge of the of a Trinity, which is objectively present in, in the things that rep represent God to us in in, 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 in cre creation in various ways, but are no longer perceptible to to uh, the in our human intellect in the state of fallen nature, as it was before in the state of in in innocence. So those are some <coughs> considerations that. Come to uh, come to mind here. If you're reflecting on your president, it's not a criticism. It's just adding a few more, a, a few more thoughts, uh, uh, thoughts to the discussion. Father James had a question. Oh. Yes, please. Um, first of all, for those of us who don't have quite the clarity of uh, mind as you do, I am very grateful for your presentation uh, uh, and. Father Peter just hit upon the question that I had. Uh, I've always found it easier to move from Bonaventure's metaphysics to his Trinitarian um, theology. Uh, could you maybe suggest a key to help us do likewise with Scotus, uh, to move from this understanding of Scotus um, that Scotus has of infinite univocal being 
what's the key for us to be able to mm. to move from there towards Scotus's understanding of the uh, Trinity? Uh, two points. Uh, two points in the que disputed questions on the Trinity. The first, first it deal it deals with the uh, with, with infinity and immensity. The concept of infinity, infinity in the Franciscan school, does not coincide. Coincide with that of the Franciscan school. I'm not saying that we can know what is is actually infinite in the matter, but the important distinctions uh, distinctions that are made to understand what is meant by infinity in question four. In question four, that is a marvelous pre presentation. I, I don't know of any before or after after that. I, uh, that uh, are so clear as that of St. Bon bon Bonaventure. And the other important article is the uh, question is the se seventh one on necessary. What do you mean by necessary? And I would say that anyone who wishes to understand the argument of Scotus for the existence of the infinite, <laughs> infinite necessary being, uh, being, in order to understand what is simply meant by it, uh, sorry, let alone make use of them correctly in a, an argument of this kind, <coughs> should first study very carefully the first article of question four and the first article of, of questions, uh, question seven. And then you will appreciate how this involves, as it were, or not another treatise on the triune is distinct from the uh, the oneness of, of God, but the principle followed by the venture follows the, uh, the, the, the role. Uh, one because he is triune, triune because he is one. one. And uh, uh, but most people say that's silly. Uh, silly. Cardinal Newman answers very nicely in the grammar of uh, gra grammar of uh, ascent. The purely mathematical use of, of, of numbers, and then the metaphysical use of numbers, which isn't a, which isn't a, which isn't the same. This is what Bonaventure is doing. doing it. Bonaventure doesn't agree with uh, with Saint Thomas's division of the Trinity de Deo Uno et Trino. First, you have a section on the Unity. First, you have a section on the on, on the on the on the uh, on the Trinity. But you uh, were study both in the same, uh, same, 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 same treatise. And then you would want to read Article 2 of each of those, those, uh, those questions, where he introduces the question of the, uh, of the, uh, of the three, uh, three, three persons and an inf infinite God. The three persons, all of whom are free in their ac actions. There's, there's another di uh, difference between St. Thomas and, and St. Saint, Saint Bonaventure. Mm -hmm. uh, God, in, within himself, acting acts necessarily. There is no freedom, uh, free, freedom, freedom involved. Whereas uh, the notion of freedom of, of Bonaventure stems, of course, from St. Saint, Saint, Saint Augustine and many of the other fathers of the church, and that is further developed by, 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 by Scotus is quite, quite different. And then in the seventh uh, question, in the second ar article, out of the question of correspondence between uh, uh, the necess necessary and the, uh, and the, uh, and the vo voluntary. Necessary and voluntary are not, a, are not, not, not a voluntary is essentially for, uh, for, for free. Uh, free. It's not an appetite of the in, in, intellect, uh, faith, but it is the power to act on one's, one's, one's own. It distinguishes between, between the being that is absolutely ne ne necessary per, per se and the one which is independent, uh, necessary, secundum That is, the creature made in the image and the likeness of God. Not only is it uh, in part uh, faith, but it can aspire to a share in the div divine life. Anyway, that, that's an answer to your to your, your question, how do you how do you arrive at a kind? Most people don't have a concrete notion of infinity as close as you Where can you find it? Well, you find the uh, uh, the, uh, the essentials in Saint Bonaventure. Saint Bonaventure. I don't know. I think uh, uh, you looked all over for any evidence that say uh, Blessed John uh, Scotus had actually used it. There isn't any. No, but they, but the fact is, you cannot understand what Scotus is doing with the proofs for the existence of God unless you go back and read. I advise you to reserve your, your order for three or four copies of of Caritas in Primo, in Primo, because you won't find any other work in English with that, where that is 
that is outlined, that the use Bonaventure makes without the name of university of being and the disjunctive trans, trans, trans he does use the term disjunctive transcendental, but, but there's no place he uses the term university, which makes me think that university came into the picture as a rewrite of the of uh, of uh, 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 of, of the uh, uh, theory, theory of divine illu illu illumination as set forth in the other set of disputed qu questions, question four of the Scientia Christi. So we, we understand what, uh, how our own minds work by studying how the, per uh, uh, the perfect human <coughs> knowledge of the incarnate, the incarnate word. This is why that particular question is right in the middle of the uh, of the five five uh, five to, uh, seven disputed questions the middle question is the key key uh, key, key, key question there that uh, uh, if it's read carefully there's no reason for identifying it with some kind of uh, rather weird spiritual experience illuminationist in that uh, sense of term but that is why it is generally like the terminology is all, all, all wrong it's not all all, all, all wrong because in the end, and what is meant by the uh, by uh, by the university of be, be, being is not the knowledge of this thing or that thing, but the light in which uh, uh, which uh, uh, which is more than merely the agent intellect of uh, uh, by way of way of illuminating uh, answering the qu uh, question. Once you get beyond that, then Scotus's argument is crystal clear. It's the most convincing of the arguments and enables us to use also, if, as pastoral need might require, other forms of the argument for God's existence, such as we find in St. Bonaventure, uh, but also St. Thomas. Okay. Well, I would that absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, splendid summary uh, is, uh, is vital. And uh, what's, I'm going to reaffirm what Jared wrote for us. Jared, your book, Caritas in Primo, Deals with these issues marvelously. Okay, is there a just deals with them marvelously. Is there a copy? Uh, and uh, it, 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 I can't, I can't say that cl more clearly, more clearly. That, you, and this, Father James, is a very specific answer to the question you're raising. What, what, all that Father Peter has just said, it is wrapped up beautifully by by Jared, <coughs> and uh, you'll be able to start reading that. So next time that we gather together, you're going to see we'll, we'll be able to go much further with this. This is based on what you, you said so marvelously. We're going to pause for just a few seconds as we have to go right into the next presentation. Then we'll take a break. We're a little bit behind, but this is this was absolutely worth it. Okay, I hope we caught all of the nuances to this. This is vital, vital, vital. It's all it takes. Okay, it has to be. Okay, then we'll edit it and we'll repeat it and explain this. We'll, we'll parse this in the future.